Good morning. Today is sorry about that. Good morning. Today is October 24th, and uh, we are here for our all virtual women's devotion. I appreciate these precious uh, ladies for joining us, and so we're gonna uh, pick up this morning in John 15, kind of like a follow up and a continuation of the devotions we had for the last past uh, two sessions, which came out of Jeremiah 17. And we looked at verses uh, five through nine and some of the surrounding verses, but those key texts were verse seven and eight. And so um, I just was led to, to come here to John 15. And so uh, we're gonna read through some of John 15 and then we're going to, I know you ladies are familiar with John 15, so we're not going to necessarily read the whole chapter, but we'll start off with verse five because it just kind of summarizes one through eight summarizes what we already been discussing in Jeremiah. So just for the sake of just like a brief review, we'll reread that. And then we're going to kind of focus a little bit on, um, verses 18 and that what also led me here is because yesterday a uh, message uh we were in john 15 and uh they always leave you off with discussion questions and so one of the questions i thought was really uh good to to talk about so i wanted to present that question to the group so that we can have some dialogue about that so that's found in verse 18 but Again, for context, we'll just start at verse 1 and read down. And so if one of you ladies will open us up in prayer, uh, we can go ahead and get started. Oh, gracious Father, in your precious name, we thank you for this day. For this is the day that you have made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for this opportunity to be able to come together as women, as women of God, breaking the bread, Lord Jesus, sharing your word that we may grow in the knowledge of who you are. We pray for everyone that's in attendance, those who will be viewing, those who wanted to attend and was unable. We pray for those who may be sick in their body, touch Jenny, Maya, touch um, um, Geraldine and all those and her daughter, Lord, all those who may be sick and suffering. We thank you, Lord, give us strength, and we acknowledge that you are awesome. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for that. Hey, Sister Kenyatta. Kenyatta, look like she joined us. Hey, girl. <laughs> hey, sorry. No, no, no. no you're good. I'm trying to, you multitask. trying to multitask. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's all good. All right. So I, I have up on the screen. Can you ladies see? I have it in large print. This is the largest print it'll go. Can you guys see this? John 15. I can see it pretty good, but I have my Bible as well. Okay. All right. So the translation that I have up is uh, the New Living Translation, that really just like basic, simple translation. So we'll, we'll start from there. So at verse um, one, it says, I am the true grapevine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone, verse 6, anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my father. So we'll stop there. 
So just from those eight verses, um, what do you, what are some of the similarities? I know we kind of touched on it a little bit in one of our previous devotions, but what are some of the similarities we see in these eight verses um, when we think about the previous devotions based on Jeremiah 17? What is some of what is some of the same uh, like principles we see that we can draw out? draw draw out from these verses Oops. basically the just um being able to produce good fruit if you are you know aligned with jesus and um so that's what i thought of when from those um scriptures in jeremiah 17. Mm-hmm. Oh, was it Jeremiah 17? Am I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was Jeremiah okay. 17. You in there, Jenny. Yeah, very good. A anybody else? What comes to mind when, when, we, when you consider these eight verses paralleling it to Jeremiah? Well, I, I to me, I think of the source uh, when you think in um, Jeremiah. Jeremiah is speaking about, if I remember correctly, um, about the trees being planted along the, the river bank and the source, it's same same way with the true vine. You know, mm -hmm. what we have in him is, is through him. So our source is through Christ and we cannot do or be anything without being connected um, to him. Because um, what you talked about in Jeremiah said they are like trees planted along the river brain with roots that reach, reach deep into the water, mm -hmm. uh, it brings forth. So being connected to the true vine, we're going to bring, bring forth. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Couldn't, couldn't agree with the both of you. Uh, that is like a, a parallel. And um, in my Bible, it just noted how Israel was often referred to as uh, the vine so i'm not sure if some of you can recall that but in the old testament israel will often be referred to as the vine but when we get to the new testament we know that jesus said or, or john says that when jesus came he brought what two things did jesus bring when he came It can be found somewhere in like the first chapter of the Gospel of John, where the writer says, Jesus Christ brought two things. Truth and what? Truth and grace. <laughs> it wasn't a trick question. Truth and grace. And so um, Jesus identified himself as being what? The true vine right not not a not a uh representation but the truth of what it means to be the true vine I, like sister um karen said the source he's identifying himself as the source that connects to every believer right and so our connection to christ and our ability to produce is 100 percent contingent upon our union and our connection with him no union no connection with christ no fruitfulness kind of going back to jeremiah right that um those who don't have their the proper trust in god become what barren it said mm -hmm. that they become like studded shrubs right mm -hmm. Where, which means that all growth cease so we see the same thing jesus is saying here but the only difference is is in Jeremiah, it was poetic language, but it still had a truth that the connection needed to be God. But here in the New Testament, we see Jesus identifying himself, right? The God man, we see Jesus identifying himself as the true source. So in the Old Testament, 
you see God telling the people through the prophet Jeremiah that this is, I am the vine, you know, like I am the source. You come to me for what you need, put your trust and confidence in me. Then we turn over to the New Testament and we have literally truth and grace in human form that was able to be touched. Like John says in first John, he said, listen, we're not writing to you about something we heard, but we're writing to you about what our hands have handled, what we have seen, what we have heard. And so now Jesus Christ is on the scene declaring to the, the disciples what truth is and how important it is to remain in him. Now, I also think it's important to kind of note that he laid some of the responsibility on the disciples, i.e. us as believers. He laid some of it on them. He told them that they had a responsibility. If you look at verse four, he said to remain in me and I will remain in you for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. So he literally gave them a responsibility to abide in, in him. Now, what do you guys think of when you think about abiding in Christ? Or what do you think Jesus meant to the apostles when he told them to remain in him? Or it's some versions may use the word abide. Having fellowship. You say, Karen, can you repeat that? Have in fellowship, a relationship. Mm -hmm. Amen. I think Karen said earlier about him being your source and just like resting in him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Nicole, Maya, any of you want to add to that? What comes to mind when you think of uh, what Christ meant when he told the apostles to remain in him? What, what that what did that look like to you all uh, just even to me to the text. that okay mm -hmm. yeah to abide in him uh to me that looks like to rest in him like you mm -hmm. know not like physical rest but mental rest you know mm -hmm. spiritual rest to not worry to not feel anxious that's what it means when when i read it to, mm -hmm. you know to abide mm -hmm. yes and I when I think it, of abide, like if mm -hmm. you abide somewhere, you live there. So I don't know if that makes sense, but like yes, basically does. we like live through him mm -hmm. or he lives yeah. through us, but I don't know. I'm trying to word it differently, but just yeah, living your whole life out just um, in reflection of him. Amen. Now Amen. look at verse seven, you are. I'm sorry. Was somebody about this? Karen, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I just said amen to what she said. Mm -hmm. That was good. Now look at verse seven. Can you guys see that? He said, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. So he's going back to his words remaining in them, right? Remember at verse, um, where is it? Verse three, look at what he said. You have already been pruned and purified by what the message I have given you. And there's also another place somewhere in this same book, I can't think of the chapter, but in John, where he says that the words he speak is spirit and life. And we know in the Old Testament, it says that God's name, you know what I'm saying? That how important God's character and who he is and how important his word is. So we still see that even being translated through the message of Jesus that listen, my message, the words that I am giving you, it's important for you to remain in those things. It's important for you to uh, strive to live those things out that I'm telling you. Because when you go on and read verses 9 down to 17, he started to talk to them about how he has loved the Father and how he wants his love to remain in them. And then he starts to talk a little bit about obedience and how obedience is is equated to keeping God's command. So just look at verse 10. When you obey my commands, you what? You remain or you abide in my love, right? Just as I obey my father's command and remain in his love. So he's equating obedience to uh, keeping his commandments, right? And so I know sometimes people... Um, can 
focus a lot on grace and we know that we have a faith that is not rested meaning we did not enter into salvation with the lord jesus by any merit or any good that we've done no work can atone for our sins we understand that but i oftentimes think from what i hear you know in the you know our different christian circles that there's a lot of emphasis on grace and sometimes i think we can lose focus on this part of it like obeying them that there's that that the obedience is evidence that we do love them that we are abiding that we are remaining and the grace is actually there to enable us to obey i think sometimes people want to separate god's grace from like keeping his commandments or his obedience but no grace is actually there to help us to obey him. <laughs> you know what i mean so i think it's important to you know just not go to one extreme you know or the other but to keep just like a healthy balance of what jesus is saying and what responsibility he's laid that he laid according to what we're reading now that he's laying on the um, apostles which we know also would be true for us that he would still require even us you know to obey him so if we keep karen did you want to say something i'm sorry no, uh uh. Okay, so if we keep reading, he goes on to talk more about having his joy and how he wants us to love one another and how he considers them his friends and how they're not a slave because a slave doesn't know the master's plans. He, he goes into all of that, right? And then at verse 17, he says, This is my command love each other. Now, 18 is where I want to park for a minute. It says, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world will love you as one of his own if you belong to it. But you are no longer part of the world, right? I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. Now, he's literally talking to the apostles here. Like the Lord literally handpicked them. We all know the story. He literally went around and he handpicked the you know disciples to be apostles right so is is it, what he's saying here is literally tied to a historical context like he's talking to these specific people and he said that i chose you to come out of the world and so it hates you but i think the principle of the world will love his own but because you're not of the world they you know they're not going to love you i think that principle is still relevant um to all his followers, all his believers. So this is the question that uh, was asked yesterday after the sermon was given. It says, what do you do with verse 18? Do you have a tendency to soften the words of Jesus here? So do we have a tendency to soften the words of Jesus in verse 18? And are they only relevant to his culture and day and what does this mean for us so do we tend to soften verse 18 and is it relevant to us and uh what does this mean to us so anybody can speak to any of those questions oh, or all okay uh if the world hates you remember that it hated me first mm -hmm. yes right mm -hmm. i think we do tend to soften it by compromising mm -hmm. what we believe you know what i mean like Okay, I I use myself as an example. I have a family member who told me that they don't believe everything in the Bible. Um, in the past, when I first became a believer, you know, they physically attacked me for answering a question that they had asked with, you know, biblical answers. Mm -hmm. And so when I first came to the Lord, I loved them so much that I hid my light under, you know, a bush. Mm -hmm. You know, I never tried to like really like minister to them. I didn't try to, you know, live my life according to what I believe. But when I when I was with them in their presence, I did the things that they did. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. so as to show them that, you know, I love you. You know, I care about you. And I don't not want to be around you because of Jesus. Like that's how I feel like I, I soften 
the the blow of the words, you know, mm-hmm. not realizing that this person hates me because they hate God. Right. And it and it wasn't until later on in the future that I realized that they really, you know, they don't know the Lord, they don't love the Lord, you know, but now I don't even care, you know, <laughs> I mean, hate mm-hmm. me, you know. So I I had to grow. And accept yeah. that hard truth, right? For what yes, you're saying. Yep. I really had to accept it. It it says what it says. If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. That means even your family. It can it can be your mama, your daddy, your uncle, your aunties, your siblings, your mm-hmm. spouse. It could be anybody. Right. Right. Thank you for sharing, Nicole. Anybody else well, like to speak to that? Or do I need to repeat the question? We're talking about verse 18. If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. And the question is, um, what do we do with that verse? Do we have a tendency to soften the words of Jesus? Are they only relevant to his culture and day? And what does this mean for us? So what what does verse 18 mean for us, even though he was talking directly to his disciples? Um, I think sometimes, so about um, trying to soften the words, I think sometimes we'll look at it from a natural standpoint, like if people of the world, they love us like as a natural family member or, oh, but that person's so nice to me and they they love me that we forget about like the spiritual side of it and um you know, like they don't like the standards that we have. They don't like the godly things about us and they don't love God. So I think we do try to soften it by saying, oh, well, they're so nice or, you know, they love me. And um, and then sometimes we'll try to dumb down God's word, like I think Sister Nicole said. So, for example, one time I was talking to a coworker and I think it's right when um, gay marriage was approved or legalized and they had um, mentioned it to me. And then I, I didn't want to like go by like what God said. I was just like, Oh well, yeah, you know, you know, that's nice. My 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 husband, uh, his, you know, somebody he works with, he's he's um, he's gay, marriage, and he's a really nice guy. And then later, I just felt so convicted that whole day. Like, why did that make it seem like I thought it was okay? Um, mm-hmm. and I just kept thinking about it. Like, why was I dumbing down God's word just because I didn't want to look embarrassed? So I think a lot of times we will, um, you know, just try not to be judged by people but we need to go with God's truth and what we believe and stand on it and not try to you know look good in front of some people of the world amen amen anybody else want to add to that question what does uh, verse 18 uh, look like for us what relevance does it have for us? I think it's very relevant for us. Mm-hmm. And but I agree that we do tend, I think someone mentioned it may have been Nicole, you know, we compromise, you know, because of faith sake, you know, but why do we do that? You know, I then I think if we're doing that because I've done it as well, then maybe I need to step back and question, you know, myself in mm-hmm. terms of my truly sold out. Um, and I think he was preparing the disciples because if you even look at the next verse, it says the world will love you as one of its own if you belong to it, you know, but you are no longer part of the world. So right. I think he was letting us know you have to separate yourself from the world. And, you know, we have to arm ourselves and be prepared. The world is going to hate us because the world mm-hmm. don't know. So they automatically going to hate us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I do we compromise and I think it's extremely relevant um, mm-hmm. to today. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Any, anyone else want to say anything? Sister Belinda? Anybody else? The Lord. Yes. Okay. Okay. Praise the Lord, everyone. <laughs> Praise him. I am I'm at work, so Thanks when so you call my name, give me like 30 seconds to run into a room. <laughs> <laughs> right. But um 
I agree with everyone. <clears throat> and right, even right now, I'm in a situation where um, I think two people talked about the gay thing. I'm in that situation right now at my job. And we at a place where we can't even ask any questions. So if there's a guy up here right now and his name is Lance, but he wants us to call him Jessica. Now at this point, I refuse to call him Jessica. So I don't call him nothing. And I, I don't know for sure, but if I call him Lance, that I might can get in trouble for calling him Lance because that is no longer his name. Wow. He is he's supposed to be going through the whole gender trans action <laughs> theme completely. <laughs> so I just wanted to ask a question and they told me I couldn't even ask a question. So I waited and I said, you know what, I'm gonna leave it alone. And like the young lady said, I felt bad. I felt, I'm like, no, I have rights too. And my question only was, what bathroom, once he gets his sex change, what bathroom do he go into? <clears throat> so I if opposed me asking this question to my um, supervisor, who that's who I was going to ask it to. I asked it to my junior rep. And my okay. union rep came back to me two days later and basically said that once he gets the change, he can use any bathroom that he wants to use. He has choices. He can yeah. use the men's bathroom, the woman's bathroom, or the unisex bathroom, which I feel he should use just the oh, yeah. unisex bathroom. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, when they come back and ask any questions, I refuse to ask because I'm like, okay, I don't want to start nothing. But like the young lady said, I felt guilty. And I was like, no, I have rights as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to even take a little bit further, but I haven't yet, but I'm going to take it even a little bit further. And I like real quick, I think that's what the Karen said, is to, that we have to prepare ourselves because the world is going to hate us because mm -hmm. we're going to go against mm -hmm. them because of godliness. But I do, even though we didn't go that far yet, I was there. I do like verse 26. If you go down a little bit more, it said, but when the helper comes, so we, we're going to have something. Um, I'm not going to say something. We're going to have someone, which is the helper, which is our comforter, that mm. is going to be with us regardless say it, of what it. happens when the world begins, start in, whatever, to hate us, which they already have. Um, we have a comforter. We have that helper. So we're going to win regardless. It may look like we're losing, but we we know that we're on the winning side. So verse 26, we haven't got there yet. Let us know that. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you mm -hmm. from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And that mm -hmm. helper is in us. And we know that that helper is the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. And the thing about it, um, what all of you have been saying is that we got to prepare ourselves, but we we have to accept the truth that hatred is going to come. And I'm a person that don't like tension. I don't believe it or not. I know some of you feel that I'm very vocal and I do kind of speak um specifically when it comes to God in the word. I, I don't mind talking and speaking about my faith, but I don't like tension. And um, at times, tension may be a part of what you have to contend with simply because you're dealing with this. I'm not talking about differences you might have with your sister, your fellow, you know, sister or brother in the Lord. I'm saying from without. Well, we're talking about the world systems like you guys are talking about unsaved family members or, you know, um, the job and just, you know, our government systems and philosophies and, and all of that that they want to impose on us. We really do have to embrace ourselves. And I know pastors and we've been hearing it in a, in a you know, Christian realm for the last several years that. We have to prepare ourselves. Trouble is coming. And it's like it's here, but it I, I think maybe we still haven't maybe fully digested just yet because it hasn't maybe hit us with full impact. It's almost like uh um what do you call those things that be falling from the sky sometimes that they be worried about when they're out of space and they can't fall and hit the earth? What are those things called? Meteors? meteorite yes. 
Right. So it's like a meteor. We know it's coming, but it have it maybe fully boom, like, you know, like impacted us. We can see some small impacts like what Belinda described on her job. You know, when Jenny dealt with with the, uh, the, the law passing, but the full impact of them even getting to a place where they could potentially tell us that literally our views is hate speech, which means they're going to try to muzzle mm -hmm. certain texts. They're going to try to limit what we can say God's counsel is. So it's like these are small little pockets that God is showing us as a church that, hey, prepare yourself because that meteor is when it hit, <laughs> if we're not ready, and I'm not laughing because it's funny, but I'm just like, if we're not ready, you know, our responses are not going to be God honoring responses, right? And that's for right. all of us, like Sister Karen said, and she's been guilty, I've been guilty. We all have been guilty at times for not speaking up fully simply because we just wanted to keep the peace or we didn't want to be ostracized or we didn't want to be categorized as Bible thumpers or, how, you know, what people call us on our jobs. But um, that's what I have to say about it. But any, we're down to our last three minutes. Anybody else have any other questions or comments or any other commentary you'd like to add to um, today's to today's uh, devotion it's not the typical devotion in that we're talking about <laughs> peace and you know God is just love which he is these verses did talk about love but it's also hitting us with obedience and just the reality uh, uh, things that we have to contend with as being Christ followers. I just wanted to say that um, we just shouldn't have no fear, no more fear, no more being afraid of losing a relationship with somebody, even if it is a close family member that you love dearly, um, even if it is a friend, we can't have no more fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. And we got to be sold out. I, yeah. I, we have to be sold out. You know, so these lessons are really needed, you know, because persecution on the church is coming and it's already here, like, yeah. like Jerry said. But the impact is going to be even beyond what we can imagine. And there's a saying the time to prepare for war in the time of peace. So the more that we encourage each other with these words and, and edify each other and challenge each other's truth and their faith in God, the better effective we're going to be for the kingdom of God. Amen. 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 Well, we're down to our last uh, minute and 20 seconds. So dear Lord, we thank you for this time of devotion and just looking to your word, Lord God. We thank you that you are such a gracious and good father, Lord. We thank you that you embody truth and grace. We thank you for the truth we have through being able to read your word. We thank you for your grace that is sufficient to keep us. We thank you for your grace that is renewed every morning to provide what we need. We pray, oh God, that we would lean more on you, oh God, that we would do our part, that we would obey, that we would strive to seek to obey your word lord god we pray that you will help us to always remember that our lifeline our support literally rests in you and apart from you we can do nothing oh god we pray that you will remove pride out of the way and help us to always be mindful of our need for you and mindful of our need for the comforter to lead guide us into all truth and to give us the boldness to stand up for your word when faced um, with opposition, Lord. Help us not to back down, but help us to stand firm and strong. And we just thank you for this time of fellowship and devotion and pray that you would just strengthen us and be with us. In Jesus' name we 